Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Now Paul's been teaching this, and th- he's teaching, remember, to the church at Corinth, which was the church he planted on a second missionary journey. And the church he actually, I mean, he was the founding pastor of it as a missionary. He founded the church at Corinth. He stayed there for a year and a half. He taught them the word of God. Then he went on back to his home base and then was sent out on the third missionary journey. And today we're going to find out where he actually is writing the letter from. You know, some people always, when I tell them these things, like, you know, the background of the book, they're like, how do you know all this stuff? I say, it's in the book. I can't come up with the detail. I don't make this stuff up. I, I, just, I just investigate what's in the scripture. But I'm going to show you how I find out some of this stuff. I find out because, well, it's, it's spelled out in the, in the chapter, and all you have to do is like take a little... Paul didn't just write one book. Right? How many books did he write of the New Testament, of the 27 books we have? We, we, not a third. No, no, no. We got... Paul, Paul is... Paul has written 13 of the, of the 27, and if you, if you credit him with participati- par- 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 participating in the writing of the book of Hebrews, because we know they use plural, we, we, the writers of Hebrews, um, put that in. It sounds like maybe it's Luke and Paul from the style, you know, put together. I don't know that, though. That's one of, uh, that's, don't say Pastor Izzy said it's Luke and Paul are the authors, because it doesn't say who the authors are. Just as breathed of the Holy Ghost and has really good study about Jesus. And when I get to heaven, it's on my list. You can, if you want to get behind me, I can look like the stupid one. Lord, who wrote this and who did that? And Still got a lot of stuff I have unanswered, but, but it doesn't make me quit my faith. It just makes me excited to look forward to seeing the Lord. Well, in this chapter, chapter 16, verse 1, we pick up with some of the clues. that These are clues that I know about because of the book of Acts where Paul was doing his missionary journeys, and Luke is the one who wrote the book of Acts. I, I call Acts Luke 2, you know. It's, it's like Luke con- continued, you know. You got Luke 1, and then the continuation is the book of Acts uh, to Luke. It's same author. The first one is about all Jesus began to do and teach, and then the second one is from the time of his being ascension into heaven, and then what happened in the early church days. So all the Luke 2 Acts is um, what happened in early church days, and it's recorded for us the details to this. Uh, they overlay with, this overlays with Acts 19 through 21. Chapter 16 of Corinthians is overlaid with Acts 19 through 21. For ex- only for extra credit for you, extra later reading, you know, when you're like, I gotta find out where he got this stuff. Now I'm gonna point out a few highlights just for you today, because it says here in verse, si- verse one of chapter 16, he says, now concerning the collection for the saints. What saints is he talking about? Does anyone know? Who is, who is Paul collecting money for? Did Paul ever take a collection for himself, by the way? Never. He said, my hands have ministered to my own needs. Anyone can tell me how he t- took care of himself? What did he do to take care of himself? He was a tent maker. And he says, and I also tended to the men that were traveling with me. He literally... M- you know, we would look at him like um, in today's kind of society, he was a, a businessman, a small businessman that took care of not just making a business that took care of himself. It's like having a small um, construction company, you know. He built stuff uh, that people could live in, and he he employed other guys, and he helped them get into the building trades. And Priscilla and Aquila, remember that couple from Italy, the the Italian Jews, they, they too were, were tent makers by trade. So we, we're going to see them actually kind of how God wove their lives together just through their occupation, but also wove their lives together through their calling in, in the gospel. Because Paul says, listen, concerning the collection for the saints, what he's talking about is the saints that are in Jerusalem. At this time in, in Jerusalem, there was a great persecution that had arisen against the Jews and against Christianity. By the way, has that changed? I mean, today, one guy came up to me and said, 
what's um what's with the guys from over in Syria? Do they like the Jewish people in Jerusalem? Or like, no, they like to the, scour them from the face of the earth. I mean, they would they would be just so happy if they could nuke and just completely wipe out all of the Christians and all of the Jews. I'm just telling you, that's the I've been there five times. The attitude is we hate. We hate you guys. We want you dead. You go, oh, okay, God bless you too. I pray for your salvation. That's what I do when they, when they say stuff like that. But, but Paul, on his third missionary journey, he's, he's going to tell us now, he's writing this letter back to the guys that he planted the church on a second journey from. And, and he says, it, it, during this season, this time, this is for those people, some of you guys like... Um, to know where we are on the timeline chronologically. Does anyone else besides me like to know that stuff? Like, this is 53 AD to 58 AD. A five-year period is Paul's third missionary journey. Okay? And he's on this journey, and I'm going to actually pin down where he is in the journey for you in just a minute because it's here in the, in, in the book of 1 Corinthians 16. He says, but guys, before I get to, to that, he says, I got to talk to you about the, the receiving of the, of the tithes or the gifts for the poor. Listen to what he says. Now, I, I submit to you, I have never heard an American preacher ever preach what Paul is about to say right here, ever. Listen to what he says. He says, concerning the collection for the saints... As I have directed the churches of Galatia, that whole Galatian region, so also I direct you that on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and to save as, as he may prosper so that no collections would be made when I come. What? Have you ever heard of a traveling preacher that said, don't get it all arranged before I get here because I don't want any collections done when I'm there? I mean, most of these American preachers are like, take five collections when I get there. You know? The, Paul's like, I don't even want one collection taken when I'm there. And he says, and when I arrive, whomever that you may approve, not him, whoever you guys approve to carry the money, I'll send, uh, I will send them with letters to carry the gift to Jerusalem. Y you just tell me who the good guy is that you trust. You trust him? Okay, I'll send him with the money. And I'll, I'll just write the letter that introduces the fellow that you tell me is trustworthy to carry the money. What kind of preacher is this? He doesn't even ask for the money. First, he doesn't want to be associated with it being gathered. Then he doesn't want to be associated with carrying it. Let some other guy take care of it. That's not my kuleana. That's not my thing. Let the other guy do it. I'll just write a letter that says, you know, of introduction. This is the guy from Corinth that is sending a love gift for the poor. And if, he says, if, only if, verse 4, if it's fitting for me, I will also go with him. If it seems fitting, you want me to accompany the guy, okay, I'll, I'll go with him, you know. This is Paul's already third missionary journey. Does he know the ropes of how to get around? You know, how to get back to Jerusalem, how to take somebody who maybe not traveled and help them get, you know, on the ship, get through the through the whole passage and all the stuff. He, he's like, if it's fitting, you need me to go, I'll go. But, uh, but Paul didn't really care about the money. And in verse 5, he says, but, but I will come to you after I go through Macedonia. For I'm going on now through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you. I'll even get to spend the winter with you so that you, you may send me on my way wherever I may go. He says, for I do not wish to see you now just in passing. I don't, I don't want to just stop for a minute. He says, I want to come and stay with you a bit. And he says, for I hope to remain with you for some time, verse 7 says, if the Lord permits. You know, here's where Paul really recognizes we have plans and hopes and desires, but who's really in charge? The Lord. If the Lord permits. You know, I got all these plans, but if the Lord permits it, this is what I'd like to do. I'd like to stay on with you. He says, but, verse 8, here's how I know where he's writing from. But he says in verse 8, but I will remain on in Ephesus until Pentecost. Here's our clue. He's writing from Ephesus. He says, for a wide door for effective service has opened to me here. And also there are many adversaries. <laughs> yeah, you're right. 
You guys that know the book of Acts, what I referred to in Acts 19, you know what happened when Paul got to Ephesus, right? Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Do you guys remember this chant in the Colosseum? Great is great. Well, great what? Or Diana, if you go with the Greek name. Great is Diana. What, what were they worshiping? They were worshiping idols, false gods. And Paul, that's where he makes, stands up and makes a discourse that, you know, he's, he was telling, teaching in their, in, in their community, any god that's made by human hands, any sculpture, any carving, any casting of, of molten metal that you make into an image, he said, that thing is not a god. That is something what man made. And anything that man can make does not make God because it is God that makes man. And the Bible says we do not worship the creation, we worship the creator, the one, the maker of heaven and earth. We don't worship the junk down here, especially the junk what some other guy made. Well, this didn't go over too good in, in Ephesus because they wanted to, they wanted to kill Paul. They were, he, was, he was ruining their business. They couldn't sell no more little trinkets. You know, all their little Diana statues, nobody's buying. You go, that ain't no God, you know. And nobody's, the, wouldn't it be nice to be known as the preacher that taught the truth so well that all the guys that were doing false stuff were going out of business? And you, you don't have to pick at the false things. You just teach the truth and people start turning. Let, let me, if you don't mind, bear with me. This part is so good, I have to show you this. Because I came to Christ... Before I was a Christian, I hung out with Satanists. I wasn't the good boy that learned Jesus all quite the easy route. I was one of those kids that raised in a good Catholic, Italian, Roman Catholic upbringing. We kind of taught about God. He's like over there. Very important. Don't mess with him. If you need to get a message to him, talk to the priest. Put some money in the plate. The priest will talk. You know, he'll come. Not what the scripture ta taught, but that's what men taught. Tradition of men. And and interesting to me, you know, it gave a lot of room for me to find out. I knew the devil was real, too. But I had friends that worshipped the devil and let demons into them and participated in some pretty wicked deeds of darkness. And it wasn't until I saw how dark dark could get that I realized, if, if Satan's really this real, wait a minute, then God has to be real, too. I mean, and I was the weirdo in the group. I was like... Um, I think that we should go with the winning group. Because, I mean, I don't know much Bible, but, but you know, when you're raised Catholic, the nuns teach you. Like, because I, I even asked, what's the book of Revelation about? And the nun, she, she was so sweet. She, this, is, this is at St. Teresa's in, in Arizona when, when I was a young boy. She goes, uh, let me read it and get back to you tomorrow. And she went and read the whole book of Revelation. And I've shared this before, but she came back and she's, the, this is to young children, you know, I was like third grade, asking, what is this book of Revelation at the end of the Bible? And she's, she goes, well, to sum up, in the end there's going to be a fight between good and evil. And there's two-thirds, two-thirds, two good angels for every fallen angel. Those are the, the bad angels. They're called demons. But they're just angels that rebelled. So you got one-third with Satan, two-thirds with God, and in the end, this is how she summed up Revelation, which, by the way, is the best sum-up I've ever heard. In the end, when they fight, the good guys win, the bad guys lose. <laughs> now, you might think that that's too overly simplified for, you know, the gospel message, but because of that, when I was hanging out with Satanists, I went, wait a minute, you guys have a lot of power, and you do a lot of crazy things with that power, and... And, you're, and you really think that, and, and they would tell me, it doesn't matter that we're going to hell because we're going to be with our friends and we're going to party <laughs> in hell. It's going to be a big party together. So it's not, they didn't, they didn't even pretend like, hey, we're not going to go to hell. We know what we're doing is wrong. We know we're going to go to hell for it, but it doesn't matter. And here's how this, the devil deceived him. He said, it's just going to be a big party with all your friends. Who wants to go, and this is what they used to say, who wants to go to heaven and play a harp? <laughs> how boring, you know? They would say stuff like that. They made heaven sound terrible. They didn't read the scripture. If you read the scripture, you know heaven is awesome. And if you read the scripture, wh what does it say about hell? 
An everlasting, is not awesome, everlasting lake of fire where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeth. That's how you grind your teeth down to nubs. And there's the sheer pain of those raw nerves firing. That's, you get to keep that forever and ever and ever. And on top of that, they don't have any beverage service. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, I'm fond of my drug. <sighs> the water is good. You know that you beg for one drop and you don't even get it? One drop of this. You ain't going to get it, though. So the, 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 the lie that my Satanist buddies would say, we're going to party together and we're going to be having a great time. I'm like, what are you going to be drinking? There ain't nothing to drink. There's no beverage service. You're going to be you're going to be in torment from that flame. And I I've shared this too when I finally got to, you know, I, I had great care for my friends. I became a Christian because of this very truth that I decided I want to be on the good side. I want to be on the winning team. Forget joining the losers. I mean, I I played enough dodgeball and you know, games at school, and, you know, it's never fun being on the team that lost. I want to be with the winners. So I made a decision. I'm not going to join the group because I want to be with the winners. And they went, too late, then we're going to kill you. And it made me really sketched out. See, I hadn't really come to Christ yet. I just knew that God was the winning side, and somehow I needed to get to Him. And it would be for two or three months of living with with every crack, every noise around me, I jump ready to fight because these guys were ready to kill me. And it gets you paranoid. It gets you sketchy. You get really weird. You do bad things when people touch you from behind. You know, and you don't even mean to. You just snap their wrist before they, you know, and all they were doing is going, hi. And you just, it's bad. And the Lord goes, I am going to get you to me. And the Lord did get my attention, and I'm so grateful. And after he got my attention, and Jesus came into my life, and I knew I was born again, I wanted my friend, my Satanist friend, to know Jesus. And I went to him and said, Jesus is real. And, and you're on the wrong side. You're going to lose. And you're not going to have a drink of water. And I read him the scripture. You're going to be in torment of flame. And I don't want you to be because I care about you. And his buddies were around laughing at me, mocking me the whole time. All the other Satanists in the group were mocking me. And I just, I was like, how do I get through to you? You, you don't even perceive. This is an eternal lake of fire. You're not going to be having fun. And he's like, oh, and they're all laughing. We're going to be having fun. And they're partying and doing dope. And, and I just, I go, I, I grab one of the lighters from one of the guys. And I grab my friend's arm. I've shared this before, but I, I put his arm under right here and and got it right here and I had his wrist right here and I held it real tight and I just locked on and I took that little big lighter and I turned it all the way to the plus you know it makes like a flame like what that big you know three inches maybe and I'm like <coughs> and I'm and I'm catching his hair on his hand on fire and it lights and he is shaking me I, I, I only weighed like 78 pounds and I, he is shaking me around like a rag doll, but I am not letting go. And I keep relighting it. The bit keeps blowing out just because he's throwing me so fast. And I keep relighting it, and I keep relighting it. And I had said to him, I will quit telling you about this if you will answer me one question honestly. And that's when I grabbed his hand to light him on fire. Now, this is a, worse, this is a, a witnessing technique I don't really recommend, <laughs> but... If you are dealing with a Satan-possessed person that just is deceived, sometimes you have to, you know, Jesus said the truth sets you free. So I continue to try to light him on fire after I don't know how long of being slapped around and drug all over the room. And all, guess what all the Satanist buddies were doing? Well, I'm lighting him on fire. You know what they're, do you know how many came to his, his aid? None. They sat around laughing. Is he crazy? Now, I knew that, but the, the thing is, is that He's going, get off me, get off me. And I'm just like, <laughs> and I, I said, I'll get off if you answer me one question in the truth. And he's, I keep lighting him. I just, <laughs> come on, man, get, 
thing doesn't work very good. And I said, all right, all right, what is it? And I still had his arm, and I looked him right in the eye and said, I got a question for you. And I flicked the bick and right in his face. I said, see this little flame? When this little flame was licking your hand, how, many, how much fun were you having? How, many, how, much f how, how much were you thinking, what a great time it is with all my buddies here? And, and how much aid did they give you? Not one of them got off their lazy butt and came and helped you. I'm sitting here lighting you on fire. Some true friends you have. I said, I'm your true friend. I'm telling you, if you don't repent, you're going to burn in an everlasting lake of this stuff, and you won't even be thinking about them. Because if you think for one second, all you could think of was, i got to get away from this little, little bit. What do you think you're going to be thinking when it's a flamethrower, a, a lake of fire just consumed, just constantly burning you, but you can't get away from it? You'll be in torment. And I don't want you to be. I want you to come to Jesus. You need to get rid of that demon. Tell him, get out. And, and oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you this, but I told him before this happened, I said, Jesus, I need to talk to him, but I need his demon not to come around. So could you keep his demon away? When I was a new Christian, I didn't know all this, like, you know, stuff about how to cast out demons and stuff like that. I just, I just knew Jesus had more power than the demon. So I'm like, demon, get lost. I need to talk to my friend. Well, he sat there just puzzled, look. Eventually, he wound up going to, I'm trying to think what you call it in English. It's a prison, penitentiary. He gets caught for some of the stuff he did with his demon, and he winds up life sentence. And in jail, a chaplain comes to him and starts preaching the gospel to him. And guess what? He got saved. And miracle of all miracles, they let him go. And he teaches Sunday school in Arizona at one of the Baptist churches, and he's spirit-filled. In a church where they don't even say that the Holy Spirit is really real. I mean, he was from back then, but not today. And I'm like, this guy knows better. I'm like, what are you doing there? He goes, I have to be a light where God told me to be a light. I'm like, Lord, you have a funny sense of humor. But see, in the book of Acts, chapter 19, when Paul said, there were many adversaries to the gospel. As he's writing to the church at Corinth. There's many adversaries. Let me show you what he's talking about. It says, it's really funny. Acts 19 and verse 11 says, God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hand of Paul. In verse 12 of Acts 19, it says, so that even the handkerchiefs or the sweat cloth, you know, what you wipe your brow with while you're working, or the aprons, <laughs> poor Paul, couldn't keep his, he couldn't keep a hanky or an apron around. Every time he, he sweat in them, the people go, Paul, touch this. We can smell it. <laughs> That's Paul. And they would steal it. they steal his apron or his handkerchief. And you know what they did with him? Some of you know this, right? For those of you who are new to this, this is really exciting. They took his hanky and they went, well, Paul touched this. So, so like, you know, his touch is on this, which means, because, you know, when Paul touches people that are sick, what happens? They got healed. Or Paul touches the guys that got a demon. The demon leaves. So they just kind of came to this thing in Ephesus, well, if Paul touched it, snag it. Because there's a sick person over there, and just take the hanky and drop it on him. Watch what happens. And they were taking this guy. He's, <laughs> they're stealing his hankies all the time. And they're giving it, it says that they would take them and put them on the body of the sick. And the diseases would leave them. And they would, and the evil spirits would go out from them, just from the, just from the handkerchief that Paul touched. And it says, and also some of the Jewish exorcists who were in that place, they attempted to name over those evil spirits in the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. You know, come out of them, you demon. And it says, verse 14 says, and seven sons of one priest named Sceva, a Jewish, a, a Jewish chief priest, these seven sons were doing this. They were name dropping. I adjure you to come out by Jesus whom Paul preaches. 
<laughs> the evil spirits that said, recognize them. They said to them, I, I recognize Jesus. And I know about Paul. But who are you? And it says, and, they, and, and the man in whom the evil, that had the evil spirit, that he leapt on them and subdued all of them. All, he beat up seven of them. One demon-possessed guy and overpowered them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Talk about a fight. This one demon was able to whoop seven guys and beat them up and strip them, send them packing just, you know, shame. Th this is, in their culture, pure shame. And it says in the <laughs> verse 17, And this became known to all, both Jews and Greeks, who lived in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them all, in the name of the Lord, and the name of the Lord Jesus was being magnified. Now many of those who had believed kept coming, and they were confessing, and they were disclosing their practices, and many of those that practiced magic brought their books together and began burning them in the sight of everyone. And they counted up the price of them, 50,000 pieces of silver worth of books, magical dark arts, and it says, and the word of the Lord was growing mightily and prevailing. Now, where did it say they had to bring their books, their dark stuff, and burn it? Did anyone tell them to? Who, who do you think told them to do that? God. That's right. It's one interesting thing that I found that the work of God's spirit, y you don't even have to tell a bad guy what he needs to do to straighten up. Because God's Spirit already beat you to the punch. I mean, these people were learning about the Lord, and they just went, man, i got to turn from my sin. This is why, the, by the way, if you, see, if you have someone in your life that's struggling with sin, like they, they seem kind of blinded by it. I, I, I kind of put these guys in the really blinded category. You know, practicing dark m magic and, you know, doing all these spells and incantation. You know, you got all the, ma the magicians, the conjurers all working together. And... And Paul just tells them about Jesus. And all you have to do is magnify Jesus. And the guys that are in dark, when they see light, guess what? They know they're dark. In fact, their dark just starts going, oh, man, that's kind of like baggage. i got to get rid of this. And it's, it's really neat because it's a work of God's Spirit. Now, you can try to artificially make people burn all their, their stuff of darkness. I found it's not really that effective. It's better when God's Spirit convicts them and they go, you know, this is really holding me back. And they just bring it. Let's get rid of this. I led a guy to Christ who was a motorcycle BMX Hall of Fame guy that he was really into it. And he, he, um, he, he, he was traveling the world circuit doing this, these, you know, dirt motocross X Games kind of stuff. And because he was spending a lot of time going to Iran and Iraq and all this thing, he came back. He had he had bongs that were like taller than me, multiple little hookah things, and he had all this. and And he had drugs from all over the world. One of the weird things is he had trailers to put his motorbikes in, and they would put them in these things, and these trailers would get shipped. and It's like nobody checked inside the trailer, so he just used it as a well, my little shipping conduit, you know, for I buy the drug cheap over there, I bring them back over here, sell them for 10 times as much, and he was living the high life. And I got the privilege to lead him to Christ, and you know what's really interesting? I didn't say a word about, well, I mean, we were surrounded by all of this drug use and drugs. He was a drug dealer. He was, the, he was known as the chief drug dealer in the whole region, and all of the underlings were coming to him. He was, their, he, he was the source. And I lead him to Christ, and he starts going, i got to get rid of this stuff. And he starts dumping out kilos of stuff and flushing it down the toilet. I didn't say a word about it. I just said, you need Jesus. Jesus is who's important in this story. Get magnified Jesus, and what happens? You turn the lights on, and dark just looks really dark. If you've got some dark corners in your heart, don't worry. I always tell people, just keep, keep steering them to Jesus. Because what will happen is he will take care of whatever they're, whatever's holding them back. He knows. And he'll, he'll have them 
hey, give me that. And they'll just give it over to the Lord, and the Lord will take it. Just like these guys. 50,000 pieces of silver worth of books. You think that, in that day, was that a lot? I mean, <laughs> it would be like millions and millions today. And they just went, this is garbage. This is poison. This is spiritual poison. We need to burn this. They, they couldn't, like, sell it and give away the money to the, they're like, this is just poison. We got to just get rid of it. But this is because the work of the Lord was happening and people were going, wow, he's really real. These guys are being freed. And, <laughs> and the guys that try to imitate, good luck on that. I tell you what, don't try casting out a demon if you don't know Jesus. It's not going to end well for you. But if you really know him, even the demons have to listen to you, even if you're a new Christian like I was. Didn't know anything, but I knew Jesus. And the demons go, uh, yeah, we know of Izzy, and we know, we know Jesus, and we know that little squirt too. Because you know how they knew? Because I had Jesus in me. Don't ever try to name over a spirit and say, I tell you, I command you to leave in the name of Jesus whom Izzy preached on the beach. Don't do it. Won't end well for you. Make sure you know Jesus. That way you can say, like I do. I don't even tell them I command you to go. I say, Lord, could you command them to go? The Lord rebuke you, right? I always pull the, Lord, you handle it. I'll just sit behind you and watch. <laughs> go for it, man. Because he's really good at it. He can get rid of demons like, like that. Do we have people with demons today still yet? I mean, even in America? Yeah. And somehow they still come visit us on the beach. Usually before you guys get here, I'm greeted with a few of them. You ever want to see if they're really real, just come early. I mean, that's when the action happens. <laughs> we get all the, you know, warm up to the service. But they're real. And unfortunately, they, they really hold a lot of people in bondage. And I don't want the, those people to be in bondage. We've got a few of them that some of you know of some of the, the ones that are in constant torment from their demons that, they, that, they're, that they're suffering from. Let's pray for them today as we close. I'm going to come back to finish up Corinthian. Now you know he's writing from Ephesus. You know just a little what's going on in the Ephesus scenario. And next week I'll, I'll tie in what um, a few of the players from Acts and the way God's going to intertwine their lives and the message that Paul will give them. You know, it's just, it's powerful. Well, I might even finish Corinthians 16 in just two messages. It'll be a miracle, but, you know, two instead of 10 for 15. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you're a God that is real. And Lord, for the ones, wi we have some around us that suffer from oppressed, oppressed by demonic things that have crept into their lives, Lord. We have a couple of the gals that are out on the street here that are s struggling and, and have had hard lives, Lord. I just pray for them. Even now, our whole fo as a fellowship, Lord, we pray for them that you would, you would let them come to know your son, Jesus. Free them from those evil spirits. Make them able to follow you in all freedom and joy, Lord, as you've given to me a great joy in following you. And Lord, I want to thank you for the nice breeze that you're sending to us even right now, hearing our prayers this morning and giving us clear air that I could breathe to give, to give this sermon, Lord. Thank you for that, Lord. I've had such a hard week breathing. If you don't mind, Lord, would you please give us a week reprieve of Vog that we could just have a clear air in Kona for a week just so I can get a few things done around the house. I'm falling behind, Lord. I need your help. I ask that anyone else need help from the Lord besides me? Put your hand up if you do. Lord, all these that put their hand up, I pray you would give us all your help as we go from here. In Jesus, your son's precious name we pray. And Everyone that agree with me said... Amen. Would you stand with me, let's sing a closing song and send you off in the joy of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.